All right, so we need to finish talking about segmentation, targeting, positioning, and then moving to new products. And then the next exam, which was supposed to be today, but because of the snow days and all of the delays, I've had to push it back to next week. If you feel cheated by that, you let me know. I have an exam in my office that I can give you today, just for you. It's all essay. You'll love it. It'll be brilliant. Um, but if, you, uh, if you're not into that, you don't want an essay exam, uh, we'll do it on the Tuesday after we come back from spring break. So anybody have any big spring break plans before? Nobody has any big spring break plans? Where are you going? Scotland. Scotland. Why? Um, seeing my uncles. So, I haven't seen them in like 10 years. So you've got family. Well, that's, that's interesting. So, since we're talking about segmentation, what do you think is different in terms of the culture in Scotland that would lead to different segments in the market, just out of curiosity? What's one of the things they have in Scotland that we don't have here? Kilt. Kilts. I don't see a lot of people wearing kilts around here. So that's a different market segment, right? That we've been talking about. So we talked about um, the criteria and the steps in the segmentation. The vast majority of businesses in the United States are probably DBAs, doing business as sole proprietorships. And to the extent that they segment at all, they're doing it on simplicity, cost effectiveness, and ROI. Because small businesses generally operate oftentimes on a sort of crisis mode, and they've got to, anything that they invest, they've got to get an ROI. So to the extent that they're going to segment, um, target, and position, um, the first two are probably the most important. Uh, as you get more sophisticated and your companies become larger, of course, then you can start looking at doing research on potential needs of buyers and things like that, different needs among different segments and the potential to reach uh, a marketing segment. So ways to segment, the easiest ways are often um, geographic and demographic. And the example I give here for geographic was when I was getting my PhD, I was getting it at New Mexico State University. I'm originally from New Mexico, I was born in Santa Fe. So I have family still in New Mexico, so that was one contact I had with New Mexico. But more importantly, the guy who talked me into getting a PhD in marketing, um, because I didn't start out as a business major, my undergraduate degree is in political science, my master's degree is in political science, then I have the Juris Doctorate. The guy who said, you want to get a PhD in marketing, I said, I don't really want to do that, it was a guy named Gerald Gooch, and that's where he had gone. He was a professor here at UCL, and when I was associate general counsel, and a, uh, I, I had a split appointment, so my appointment was 50% faculty and 50% administrative. And he said, you know, you, really, you, you do really well at the classroom, you ought to think about teaching full-time, why don't you get a degree in marketing? I thought, I don't want to do that, I don't know anything about marketing, I'm you know, a theory guy. And he said, well, I'll tell you why I wouldn't do that, because the average starting salary of a marketing professor is $160,000 a year, and there's lots of jobs. There's about 12 jobs for every candidate that graduates every year. And so, I started thinking about that, I, that little percolated in my little brain for a while, and I thought, wow, that sounds like a pretty good deal, and it is a pretty good deal, because um, after this class, I have to meet a student for office hours, and then I'm going to go home and spend the rest of the day doing something else, whereas when I was associate general counsel, I was here all day, you know, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, usually 7 to 6 or later, depending on what was going on, so this is, this is a great deal, and I make more money than my boss did. Uh, so, it, you know, it's great. So I trotted off to, the reason I tell you this story is I, I trotted off back to New Mexico to Las Cruces, which is one of the ugliest towns on the planet. Northern New Mexico is really beautiful. Southern New Mexico, not so much. It's a desert. And they keep saying it grows on you. Yeah, sort of like a bad fungus. So it's desert. What does that mean? Well, there's not a lot of water, right? That's, that's the definition of a desert, right? Not a lot of water. I mean, there's a a technical definition it's something like they get less than I think 10, 10 inches of rain per year or something like that. Maybe less than I'm, I'm not a climatologist, but you know, desert means no water. So they ask kids, and I think I've told you all this before, in schools in Las Cruces, 
in like the third or fourth grade, where they were most likely to see a boat. And kids in Las Cruces answered on the highway. That's where they were most likely to see a boat, was on the highway. Why is that? They're passing through. There's no water, right? There is no, like, the Rio Grande River runs south of Las Cruces through a little town that's part, really kind of part of Las Cruces called Mesilla. And Rio Grande literally translates means what? Yeah, Grand River. It ain't great by the time it gets down to Las Cruces. They have dammed up the water uh, upstream so much that it's it's oftentimes just a trickle by the time it gets down to. It's not a grand. I mean, when you think of big grand rivers, uh, this is the name of the river, the Rio Grande. The, you're thinking big river or grand river. And what do you think of? Well, I don't know. In, in the United States, probably the biggest river that we think of as being a big river and a mighty river is what? It's an MM, it's an alliteration. The mighty Mississippi, right? That's our biggest watershed, right? If you go to New Orleans, which by the way, we're getting ready to go to AMA, so I should probably do a segment on marketing for AMA, get you to join AMA and, and what we can do. Uh, we take students every year to AMA. It's in New Orleans every single year at ICC. And then the Mississippi at that point is about to dump into the Gulf of Mexico. And it's a big river. You know, there are big cruise ships that come up and port in a dock in New Orleans and get passengers and lots of stuff is shipped out of the port of New Orleans. And so it's important. Um, and if you ask kids in Oklahoma, this is an idea of how geographic segmentation works. If you ask kids in Oklahoma where they're most likely to see a boat, what are they going to say? No, it's not going to be on the river because we don't have a lot of navigable rivers. We have one navigable river that is navigable to the port of Catoosa in Tulsa. That's the furthest, by the way, inland and western port until you get to the west coast in the United States. 90% of everything arrives to you by shipping in some form or fashion at some point in its journey. And Oklahoma has this port called the Port of Tucson. We also have a port at the Port of Muskogee. So we've got two major ports that are navigable. But really, generally speaking, in Oklahoma, do we have any navigable rivers in, in Oklahoma City? No, the Oklahoma River, which is really the North Canadian that they've renamed the segment of it, is not navigable, right? It's, it, it's dammed up so that there's some water in there so that they can do rowing, but it's not navigable. But if you ask kids in Oklahoma, where are you likely to see a boat, where are they going to say? On a lake, right? Because we have lots of lakes around here. Didn't have lots of lakes to begin with. They're all man-made lakes, but we have lots of lakes now. We have Lake Texoma, we have Lake Tufalo, we have in Oklahoma City, we have Hafner and Overholzer, and all of those lakes have boats on them. It's a big recreational thing to do in the summer here because it's hot in Oklahoma, and it's nice to go out and sit on the boat, drink beer, um, and you know, get in the water. So you're going to say it's in a lake. If you ask kids, in Houston, where they're most likely to see a boat, where are they going to say? Yeah, it's in the Gulf of Mexico, right? That, that's the biggest body of water close to Houston. So, as a result, when you go to the Yamaha dealer in Oklahoma City, what does the Yamaha dealer sell lots of? Well, Yamaha's brand, and I know this because I have one, is a personal watercraft. Is called the, what, anybody know? The Wave Runner, yeah. Yamaha's personal watercraft brand, that'll get you five points since you didn't have to look that up. It's called the Wave Runner. You should know these things as a marketer to speak to their brand imaging and brand management, right? So you go to the Yamaha dealer in Oklahoma City and you're going to find lots of Wave Runners. You're going to find um, the, the jet boats and things like that. You don't find any of that in the Yamaha dealer in Las Cruces. What do they have lots of in Las Cruces? Well, they have lots of desert. What do you do in the desert? If you can't use a wave runner, what's the big thing there? You go to the Yamaha dealer and they have lots of what? Dirt bikes. Huh? Dirt bikes. Dirt bikes and quads. That's the big thing there. They have lots of quads and side-by-sides, things like that that they sell. They don't sell. They'll order. If you want a wave runner, they'll order one for you, but they don't carry a lot of them in stock because not a lot of people Go to the lake in New Mexico. So ge geographic segmentation. Demographic segments are also very easy ways to segment. Uh, ethnicity, age, gender, income. More uh, 
in depth is psychographic, segmenting by uh, psychographic behaviors. So, and you should do this. Have I shown you this before, Strategic Business Insight? Strategic Business Insight, you can take the VALS test and figure out what type of person you are. And so this is an important way of figuring out what groups, once you, you want to target, um, what they're going to, the likelihood is going to be that they're going to want your product. So for example, let's take uh, one of my favorite brands, Rolex. By the way, you probably didn't know this, but Rolex is a non-for-profit company. Now, what is their benefit that they are, are giving out their products? So they're a non-profit company. Why does Rolex exist? What's the non-for-profit reason? What's the, what's the starting cost of a Rolex? The cheapest model of Rolex is called the Air King. I have a Rolex. This was this is actually 30 years old. It was my grandfather's oh, Rolex. Um, they actually started out as uh, dive watches. Um, the starting price of a Rolex, which is the Air King, which is stainless steel, no gold, and doesn't have the date in it, is five thousand dollars now. They go up ten percent every single year. So you'll never get a cheaper Rolex by waiting because Rolex goes up ten percent every single year, year over year. And Rolex is a nonprofit organization that exists basically to perpetuate the art and science of fine watchmaking. So that's that's what Rolex does. So they're this nonprofit organization in Switzerland that, that exists to perpetuate fine watchmaking. It's the Swiss make the finest watches. So valves, what types of people would be interested in valves? Or what types of people, what types of valves actually be interested in Rolex? Well, basically, VAL separates people into two things. Um, what their motivation is and their access to resources. So with regard to their motivation, there are three things that can motivate you. Ideals, achievement, or self-expression. Innovators are, are motivated by all of these things. And then it's whether or not you have high access to resources or low access to resources. So these are the valves types. Innovators are, are, are motivated by ideals. Um, they're always taking in information. They're confident enough to experiment. They like to try new things. These are the people that, when the iPhone came out years and years and years ago, I had friends that are innovators. They're both, they were, at that point in their life, what are known as dinks. Does anybody know what a dink is? It's better than a yuppie. A city, city person. No. Okay. You don't want to get dirty. Well, it's true, they don't. It stands for double income, no kids. Right? So uh, these were two professional individuals at the time. They had no kids. Uh, they had lots of money. The minute the iPhone was released, they were the ones that ran out and bought it. And I was like, that price will fall by 300 bucks in, in the next 60 days. Was it worth it? And they're like, oh, so if they're willing to experiment, they take risks, they're skeptical of advertising, they're always um, taking in information, self-directed, future-oriented. They tend to believe in science and research and development. So would an innovator be attracted to Rolex, do you think? They're motivated by ideals, achievement, and expression, all three. Do you think an innovator would be attracted? You think so? I don't know. What is Rolex? Non -profit. It's what? Non -for profit. It's a non for profit, but what type of watch does Rolex make? Smart uh, smart watches like the I, I, Apple Watch. It's not called the iWatch, it's the Apple Watch. I don't, that's a branding failure. I'm on, in my opinion, on Apple's part. No, they don't. Rolex makes what? Fine Swiss mechanical movement watches. That's what Rolex makes. It's an established brand. 
I think maybe innovators might be more attractive. Now, Tag Pure, which is also a Swiss brand, does have a smartwatch. And it's more expensive than the Apple Watch. A lot more expensive. It starts at, what does an Apple Watch start at? I think they should have kept it with the iWatch. I think they should have kept the iWatch. What? 300. About 300. What's the, at one time they did release, uh, when Apple Watch first came out, they released a very expensive one, which was 18,000. It was in rose gold and it was supposed to be wonderful. I'm like, who the hell is going to pay $18,000 for a watch? What's the wonderful thing about Rolex watches? This watch is 30 years old. Still works. Waterproof to 3,000 feet. It's a dive watch. I was in the Bahamas. We went diving. My brother and I are, are both certified divers. We get off the boat. We get out on the boat, and then we're about to get off the boat. And this this guy says, "Okay, we're going to dive here. Put all your jewelry in this black bag." And all of this boat is full of Jewish women that are just peeling off their gold and dumping it in this black bag. And I'm like, I'm "Not, not." And he's like, "The better food will strike at shiny objects." It's like, you should take your watch and put it in the bag. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not, no, I'm not putting the watch in, in your bag. No, no, I'm not doing it. I'm like, the Barracuda will have to fight me for the watch. <laughs> it's a dive watch, right? And I'm looking and I'm noticing that he's like, I'm like, did, did, did you take a head count? And he's like, no, we, we blow a horn in about 45 minutes and we'll go to the next dive spot. I'm like, head count? And I'm like, how do you know? I'm like, how do you get a note? He's like, oh, don't worry about it, man. You got your watch on. You'll know when you get back. Right, so you know, like it's an old. I don't know. I think innovators might be more attracted to something like the Tag Heuer smartwatch or the Apple Watch. Although the Apple Watch maybe now is old hat. I don't know. Um, some innovators may. It's it's debatable as to whether or not they would. Thinkers. Thinkers are motivated by ideas. They have generally. Um, a normative out, outlook. Um, thinkers have high access to resources. They have a tendency towards analysis paralysis, which means that they start, I do this. I'm probably in many respects a thinker. Um, when I've taken the VALS type survey, I've come out as an innovator before, but I, I could also be a thinker. When I start to buy something, I compile a notebook. And I start compiling the notebook on, on all of the benefits and features of whatever it is that I'm going to buy, and then I make decisions based on that sort of rational, comprehensive analysis. Um, when I was married, we needed a new microwave. Have I told you all this story? Okay, so when I was married, we needed a new microwave, and I start compiling, like, microwaves when I was a kid growing up were these very simple devices. They were expensive, but very simple. Uh, the first microwave we bought was $1,000, and that was back in the 1970s. I remember this. It had two dials on it. You open the door, you put your food in. It did not have a rotating uh, plate in the middle of it. You put your food in or whatever it was, and it had one dial for power and one dial for time. And there were only two settings on that power dial, 50% and full force. And you turn the dial for the time and it would start. At that point in time, as I recall, those microwaves didn't even have the safety feature where you had to close the door to turn it on so you could like irradiate your head if you wanted to. Where your brother's head it was a danger, products liability case came out of that. But so, you know, microwaves were expensive. So I started when we needed a new microwave. I started compiling the notebook on what are, microwaves now have all of these different things. They've got popcorn buttons on them, right? They've got a defrost button on them. They've got, uh, I've got, I had a microwave one time that was both a microwave and a toaster. They don't make that anymore. I thought that was great because one of the things that happens with microwaves is you put the stuff in and it's soggy so you can turn it on and toast it so it wouldn't be so soggy. So I started compiling a notebook. I come home and uh, my reason for living at that time, not really, because uh, I really only you know, I have to suffer from disassociative personality disorder, but we'll pretend uh, that uh, my reason for living or my insignificant other at the time. I come home and there's a new microwave. And, and I said, Robin, where did this come from? Oh, I bought it. Well, 
well, how, how did you make that selection? It matched our other appliances. Uh, well, no, no, crazy lady, no. Like, did you consult the notebook? Did, did you look, you know, at the features and benefits? No. Um, so that's thinkers. I think thinkers are going to be more attractive maybe to robots. They tend to be established, um, like traditional intellectual pursuits uh, and things like that, and they enjoy historical perspective. And Rolex is a what? It's one of the oldest, finest watchmaking companies in Switzerland. Believers are also motivated by ideals, but they have less access to resources. They have lower access to resources. They tend to watch TV, and to the extent that they read, they read romance novels to escape from reality. They're not looking to change society. They find advertising a legitimate source of information. How many of you believe advertising? Nobody. Nobody's raising their hands and jumping. Yeah, I believe it. You know, I believe everything that they tell me on the Geico commercial. Right? No. But believers do. So they tend to be consistent. They like stability. There are some of the highest rates of churchgoers. And they tend to not go to those newfangled seeker churches like Life Cult out here on I-35. <laughs> Gospel of wealth, blah, blah, immoral, psychobabble BS that they, that they spew out there. Right? Life is not about being happy necessarily. There's more life than being happy. So they tend to go to established churches. In Oklahoma, they tend to be Baptist, right? Southern Baptist. What kind of watch do you think a believer is going to go for? It ain't going to be a Rolex. What kind of watch do you think a believer is going to go for? He's going to believe in the cheapest watch the last one in time. Which would be a what? Watch that you get at Walmart. Like Timex, right? Timex, forever and ever, they're advertising. I don't even know if Timex is still around. I think they are. But, um, Timex is advertisement. They used to put two sumo wrestlers together, and they would strap a watch to, to one of them, and they'd have them go at it. And, uh, their motto was, takes a licking and keeps on ticking. So I think that may be the watch for a believer. Achievers have high access to resources. They are generally having me first, my family first attitude. They are oftentimes the first in their in their uh, family, the first generation to go to college and really achieve something, to have high achievement, to go to college, become a professional. They're generally committed to their family and their job. They're fully scheduled, goal oriented, um, generally hardworking. They are usually anchors of the status quo, are professional, and they value technology that provides a productivity boost to them. So which watch are cheapers going to want? Maybe an Apple watch. A lot of them are like you. A lot of, a lot of your generation don't wear watches. Why the hell would you have a watch? You've got a what? You got a phone! Why the hell do you need a watch? You got a phone. And it tells me the time. And not only that, as technology goes, it does what? It not only tells me the time. I mean, the problem with my Rolex is that it only tells me the time. Not only does this device tell me the time, it also tells me what I got to do. It's got my schedule on it. It's got my calendar. So, and guess what? The Apple Watch does what? Six with your phone and your calendar. Now I can't see how do you, I, I I love these people that are answering text messages on their Apple Watch. I don't see how you can do. I mean, it's like tiny. How do you see that? But but they do. Strivers motivated by achievement, but less access to resources. 
have high revolving employment, usually temporary employment. They're trying to build a better life. They love gaming. What's the most popular game now out there? Apex. Apex? Is it really? More popular than Fortnite. Yeah, Fortnite's dying out. Okay. Because the developers, their same developers have ruined the game with how much stuff they're trying to pack into it. All right. So, they like video games. Rely heavily on public transportation. They are the center of low status street culture. What's low status street culture? What's the what's the term for that now? Low status street culture. Bums. Huh? <coughs> Bums. Bums. <laughs> How low. about hipsters? Oh, I didn't, I didn't really. I saw that picture. He hipsters. looks like um, Johnny Depp from uh -huh. from this thing. Like so low status street culture hipsters, like all of those bars on Twenty Third Street, are attractive. To these kinds of people, places like you know the Mule, the Palm, things like that. What kind of watch do you think they're gonna want? <coughs> Casio. Casio, maybe something perhaps vintage. Uh, you know, I mean that's that's one of the things. Like what do you, if I've noticed that in a lot of the uh, so I have friends who live in the Paseo. And I go down there from time to time, and we, you know, go bar hopping. When, when you're when you become an attorney, you learn to drink. That, that's one of the things that you learn how to do really, really well. And so we go bar hopping, and we get all these these uh, hipster bars because they like that. It makes me crazy. The music in there, I want to run screaming from the room because it doesn't resemble music, but whatever. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed that has become very popular in those bars is it's. Going back to old school stuff, like actually playing vinyl, having a record player and playing vinyl, you know, that's that sort of a thing. So it could be, you know, a Casio or something like that. Uh, there are these new watch companies that have come up that talk about um, how how awful it is that they're gouging you on all these prices for watches, and that's a hipster company that's that's come into being, and that's one of the ones that I think would be attractive to them. They tend to wear their wealth. Experiencers want everything. They are motivated by experience. They like to go travel. Um, they're the first in and out of a trend adoption. Uh, they're up on the latest fashions usually, are sociable, view themselves. You oftentimes hear this term called marketing maven. What is a marketing maven? Well, it's somebody who likes to tell you about the deal that they got and where they got it, and how to get it. They have a heightened sense of visual stimulation. <clears throat> what kind of watch do you think experiencers are gonna want? They've now come up with the Fitbit. When I first, I got a Fitbit when they first came out, my mother bought one for everybody in our family. And I lost mine actually about a year after I got it. In New Orleans at AMA ICC, my students wanted to go out. And we went out after, we, we won a huge competition at AMA ICC and they wanted to go out. And so we went out and there was um, uh, a place that had a mechanical bull. And they, I told them they won something big that they kept daring me to get on the mechanical bull because I grew up on a ranch and so they apparently thought that, you know, that means that I could ride a mechanical bull or ride a bull. Um, I know how to ride horses. I have never been stupid enough to climb on the back of a 2,500 pound animal and let it, you know, jump around. That's just not my thing. But I do know how to ride horses. And so I, I promised them they wanted that I'd go to the, this place and ride the mechanical bull. And I did. And somewhere in that process, and I didn't realize that my Fitbit came off and it went flying. But the Fitbit at that point in time was the first year they came out. My mother got it for me. Basically, all it was was a pedometer at that point. That's all it did. It just basically counted steps. The new Fitbit watch does what? Or the new Fitbit does not just count steps, but I think it's a watch as well. I think it will also do things like what? It'll check your heart rate, your pulse. 
things like that. Monitor, it's supposed to be able to monitor your sleep activity. I don't know how it does that, but supposed to, I think that's something, the kind of product that an achiever would want. Makers, distrustful of government. These are the people who want the Second Amendment. They love their guns and they want to keep them. They have a, a strong interest in all things automotive. So they like cars. They like working on cars, particularly older cars. Outdoor interests, hunting and fishing, things like that. Uh, they want to protect what they perceive to be theirs. They're straightforward. Um, appear anti-intellectual. That could be 70% of Oklahoma, where, <laughs> where you know higher education is, makes, makes you absolutely suspect. Uh, Anti-intellectual. And they want to own land. So what kind of watch do you think a, uh, a maker is going to want? Something that's cheap and durable. Senko. Maybe. Right? You can go hunting and knock it around. It's, yeah, it's going to be okay. At the bottom, the lowest access to resource are survivors. They're cautious and extremely risk adverse. They tend to be the oldest consumers that we have. They're thrifty. Um, they are very traditional in their outlook. They take comfort and routine. Not at all concerned with being trendy. The most heavy TV viewing demographic or psychographic are survivors. Why? Huh? They stay indoors a lot of times, particularly since most of these tend to be older. They may not have as good a health. They have may have less mobility, and so television is their um, primary form of entertainment. Again, what kind of watch do you think they're going to have? I well, usually they'll have a watch, but I think it's going to be something that you get at some place. Like, what's a, a brand that survivors would would recognize and value? Um, well, that that famous French store, Jacques Benet, where J.C. Penney's is commonly called. Um, they probably in the olden days before Sears really went out and went broke, they probably. Really Sears shoppers bought something um, to know it's Sears. So take the bowel survey. If you take it and bring it to me and show me what you got, I'll give you some bonus points for that. If you talk today, I'll give you some bonus points. So psychographics, behavioral usage rate is another way to segment. How do people use it? How often do they use it? So are you, are you uh, an intense user of a product? That's one way we can segment. Are these people that buy our products over and over again, do they use it intensely, or do they use it intermittently? What kinds of things can you, you segment by behavior use? Well, all kinds of things. Um, cable usage, right? They've got different packages based on how much you're going to watch it. Lots of your generation are doing what? They're cutting the cord and not having cable. How many of you actually have cable? A couple of you? Why? You watch it, it's like thousands of channels of nothing. You can't do without it. What do you watch on cable? Sports. Sports, okay. You can get that, you know, streaming now, can't you? Through various packages. Yeah, I mean a lot of your a lot of your generation are cutting the cord. But there are cable, you know, there are people who have that's they spend a lot of their money on, on cable TV. Um, they are heavy users of that. Whereas I tend to not watch as much TV. Why do I have Cox? Well, because I want internet. And primarily, if you bundle, um, you say, what I sign up for Cox. So, another step grouping products to be sold into categories. So, for example, store layout and organization is a way that you group, cat group products. Uh, there is a a, there is a discipline, a subfield of marketing called retail anthropology that studies this. So why do they lay out supermarkets in certain ways? Well, it's because they group products by category, and they also try to get you to do what? 
They put all of the staple stuff that you need to sustain life generally at the back and force you to what? Walk, Walk all the way back there through the aisles that have all of the other junk that they want to sell you. And then when you get up to the front, they've got even more junk that they want you to buy, those impulse buys, right? Um, die for less, which is what I call buy for less, uh, <laughs> is, is perhaps the most creative in this. They actually force you to go through the entire flipping store. You go into the die for less on Northwest Expressway, it's like you go in and you have to go to the right instantly. It's kind of like President Trump insists that all of the, the illegal aliens are coming in and turning right. What? Like, no, whatever, but Die for Less forces you to turn right and go past the produce. And the reason they do that is they want you to buy that stuff, which is highly perishable first, and then wind your way through the store to get all of that. So store layout and organization. You can develop marketing grids and estimate the size of markets. Um, you put markets on a horizontal rows and your products in the vertical columns, and then you estimate size and development for each of those cells. So this is an old slide because I talk about the iPhone 7. What's the newest version of the iPhone now? It's the 10 XR. XR right? So um, I, you could. This was the segmentation challenge, but I won't do this because uh, we don't have a lot of time because we're running <clears throat> short as a result of the two snow days. Um, but what do you think the segments are for the iPhone 10? So it used to be, and the reason that I chose. Um, the seven at one point in time is because they actually had three different levels of storage or three different levels of memory. Now, with regard to Apple products, memory actually means how much stuff. What does memory mean with regard to um, Windows boxes? What does memory refer to with regard to a, a Windows OS? Oh, it's processing speed. Right? But with regard to Apple products, memory is actually memory. Right? So there were three sizes of memory that you could get for the iPhone 7. They've now, what Apple has decided is that they have decided there aren't really three segments. And so they've collapsed those, as I understand it, with the newer iPhones, are they've got two sizes of memory, right? Sort of a small and large. Now, most people don't have any clue other than like me, before I started streaming my classes live on YouTube, because YouTube didn't have a live feature when I started recording my classes, I recorded them with a camera that I could control with my iPhone. And I could actually start uploading it to my iPhone from the camera if the camera memory got full. And so I always bought the iPhone with the biggest memory because I would actually stream video to my iPhone and then upload them from my iPhone to YouTube. But that takes in a huge amount. Video is the one thing that most people will not use anywhere near the memory. Most of you will not use anywhere near the memory on your iPhone. How many of you have an iPhone? Quite a few of you. Um, you won't use nearly the amount of memory that you actually uh, that you actually probably buy. So Apple segmented it based on small, medium, and large. Most people have no idea what they're going to do. So what do they choose? We know this. It's, it's, it's as a result of McDonald's. McDonald's did everything from small, medium, and large. And what do most people pick? Medium. Medium. Most people pick medium. If they have no idea what else to, what else to do, they pick medium. Um, so they segmented it. Now they've segmented it, I think. I think you can only get the iPhone 10 in two. Is that right? Somebody know? What size? You can get it in... I know you can't get it in three. Can you get it in two, or is it just one? I think, it's, I think it might be 64, 128, and 256. But I'm not sure. I don't think you can. I think they, they collapsed the memory. Sixty-four and two fifty-six. So what they've assumed is that people either want what? 
average or jumbo? And most people can do with what? I mean, 265 gigabytes is a lot. I mean, how much? How many pictures do you take? Again, video <coughs> is different, but how many of you take huge amounts of video on your phone? So Apple has basically um, collapsed their segments. They've decided that there aren't actually three segments. So targeting. Once you've broken the market up into segments, you select the targets that you want to go after. Okay, so the criterion for selecting your targets that you want to think about, the market size. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a huge market size. Rolex does not want a huge market segment. I went into Sam's the other day and there is a Rolex for sale in the case there. I, this happened about 20 years ago, the first time I saw a Rolex for, for sale in Sam's. What Sam's does is they manage to get these products by buying out jewelry stores that are going broke. Right? And Rolex, when they found out Sam's was doing this, went crazy. And they now have huge agreements that are enormously complex and they will sue you if you sell to people like Sam's because Rolex does not want to be seen as everybody's watch. They don't want to be sold to everybody. The market size is very, very small. But what do they want? Rather than selling Timex, which wants to sell a watch to everybody for 20 bucks, Rolex only wants to sell to a limited number of people who can afford their watch. Right? There are, by the way, more expensive brands than Rolex. Paddock, for example. I think the starting cost of a paddock watch is about fifteen thousand um, dollars today, and so you know, their market size is one thing, but some companies don't necessarily want a huge market size. The expected growth of the market, again, for Rolex, is that market's growth going to grow very much? What do we know is actually happening to the wealth in the world? The number of middle class are actually shrinking, even in the United States, which has largely prided itself on being a middle class company. So it's becoming a bimodal distribution with regard to things. So there's there may be less expected growth, but Rolex knows that there's going to be a core group of people that will buy it over and over. So expected growth is not necessarily a criteria for them, but for most businesses, it's going to be. Are you going to be able to um, continue to grow? Your competitive position in the market, how do you get a competitive position. You can do it on cost, you can base it on service, things like that. What are the costs of reaching a segment? Some You may want, you may find a segment that wants your product, has a need for the product, um, but it's not really going to be feasible to reach that segment because of the cost of reaching that. What is the uh, compatibility of reaching that target segment with the organization's objectives and resources? So for example, when I was in the private sector at the American Education Corporation, our competitive position was we had the best backbone for our LMS of any of them, but we weren't flashy and we competed on price point. We were never going to compete with, we were never gonna to get to, for example, even though we were located just a few miles south of Edmond on Broadway Extension, we were never going to get our LMS into the Edmond Public Schools because we just weren't flashy enough for Edmond. And this is a wealthy school district. But our competitive advantage was we had a really solid backbone to our LMS. It was easy to work on and um, it, was, it was cheap. Positioning, positioning is the place that you occupy in the mind of the consumer. Now, if you don't position your product in the mind of consumers, they will do it for you. And you don't want them to do that. You want to be consistent in your positioning. You want to create a consistent image in the mind of the consumer. So positioning is creating that image in the mind of the consumer, or the consumer will create it for themselves if you don't. Repositioning is trying to change the mind of the consumer. And this can be very, very difficult. And the example I give here is McDonald's. McDonald's, one of their most profitable segments is the breakfast, um, the breakfast market segment people going to work and need something on their way to work quickly to eat. And so 
that was one of their most profitable areas. They started experiencing an enormous amount of competition in that segment from the tool of the devil, by the way, hate Starbucks, absolutely hate Starbucks, tool of the devil. But they started to experience a horrible amount of loss in that segment to places like Starbucks because Starbucks had what? Particularly for your generation that you wanted. Better coffee or perceived better coffee. Now Starbucks coffee is actually really crappy. They, they deliberately did this so that you would buy an espresso or a cappuccino or a mocha latte, right? So what does McDonald's start to do? If you look at their new stores or their modifications of stores, what are they doing? They are positioning themselves to look a lot more like Starbucks. Their products, their mint cafe products in the morning, they stopped selling really crappy coffee. McDonald's had really crappy coffee. Actually, who has the best coffee? It's not Starbucks. Tool of the devil, communist company, who has the best coffee? Dunkin' Donuts, okay? Dunkin' has better coffee than Starbucks. But Starbucks is cool and it's hip and it's got the mermaid brand that you all like or whatever. Yeah. So, so is uh, positioning the same as uh, perception? Perception is in the mind of the consumer. Positioning is what you try to implant. So perception is individualistic. It's what you think it is, right? Um, positioning is what you attempt to achieve. Now, if you don't do it, the consumer will do it for themselves. They'll position you in their own mind. You don't want them. That's their perception, right? What you want is you want to create, and, and by that, you want to create a perception in the mind of the consuming public that is consistent over a long period of time, and not just for one individual, I'm not just reaching out to you. McDonald's used to have on their signs, I remember when they got the, the first, when they, I remember it was probably in 1984 that McDonald's started putting up on their signs. They used to say millions and millions served, and then they got to one billion. One billion served, they put one billion. That used to be one of the things that they put on their golden arches, billions served. And so you want to create in the mind, and what did McDonald's create? Why did they serve billions of people? Well, they created, as a result of Ray Kroc's consistent management of them and, and quality control, they consisted, their, their product image, and the one that they wanted forever and ever and ever was, we are cheap, we are fast, and we are consistent. A Big Mac in, in Oklahoma City. And that, that I, I think most people would have said, that's what McDonald's was. It was cheap, fast, consistent. If I'm traveling across country and I go into, for example, in my hometown, you get off the road on, on I-35 at the second Guthrie exit, and there are some local businesses around there. There's an Arby's, there is a um, Brahms there, the McDonald's site is actually off the, at the first Guthrie exit, and I, I don't know why they put it there because it's a horrible location. But on the second Guthrie exit, which is the one that's got the most amount of stop, there's a Carl's Jr., an Arby's, a Brahms, a Sonic, a Pizza Hut, what else is there? Subway, and Golden Check. Right? Those are the those are the fast food restaurants that are there. Um, and at most of those kinds of intersections, there would be a McDonald's. And then Interspersed among that are some local restaurants. There's a place called El Rodeo, which is a Mexican restaurant. There is a place called Tokyo, which is a hibachi, not hibachi restaurant. They don't actually have the hibachi tables that they cook at. They serve it in sort of a hibachi style, but they do it at the back. You go to El Rodeo or you go to Tokyo and you don't know what you're going to get. It could be really good or it could be really god awful. And McDonald's was consistent. You got off, if you were a family traveling with kids particularly, you could get off at McDonald's. You knew the restrooms were going to be clean and that a Big Mac was going to be a Big Mac. And they started losing money to this other segment, which was Starbucks in the morning. And so they started to try and reposition themselves as being more like Starbucks. 
and getting away from that fast, cheap, and consistent image. The problem is with repositioning, it's really hard to do. Once you've established your position in the market, people don't necessarily want you to change. An example of this is when Ford bought Jaguar. Jaguar was always a fast, heavy sedan. That's, I mean, they were a luxury vehicle. They made basically two types. They made a sports car, which was a coupe, and then they made very big, heavy, fast automobiles. If, you, if you've ever driven a Jaguar, my mother had a Jaguar when I was growing up, fantastic car, if it would go, right? Uh, had lots of electrical problems. You would like turn on the windshield wipers and the windows would go down because it had what was called a Lucas Electric and Lucas Electric never did anything right. Like the British could screw up a one car funeral with regard to wiring harnesses and cars. And so, but Jaguar's motors were, were exceptionally good. So that was Jaguar's image. They get bought by Ford and Ford decides, well, we're gonna reposition the brand and we're gonna have a, like a entry level Jag, which was, and they had a medium level Jag. So they had the Jaguar X type, which was the baby Jaguar. And then they had the Jaguar S type, which was the medium. And then they had the traditional big um, XJS or the Vanden Law, but they started out with this model that was about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. The X type, horrible marketing. They tried to reposition themselves in the market. It was a miserable failure in many respects. And as a result, Ford dumped the brand. They sold it off um, because they they were not able to. They they decided to make it like a Ford. Well, that's not what people bought when they bought a Jaguar. That's not, I mean, it would be like Rolls Royce coming up with a mini Rolls Royce. That, that's not what they do, right? Um, so it can be very, very difficult to do this. Any questions? All right. New products. So companies need to constantly develop new products to be competitive. Some scholars estimate that the need for new product development needs to be about 25 or more at any given time. Now, I think this is wrong because a lot of times what they're focusing on are large corporations. Obviously, if you're a drug manufacturer, you're going to be working on far more than 25 products at a given time if you want to be competitive, right? There's lots of things that are coming out, lots of developments. What's recently happened in terms of health? I remember when AIDS first occurred. At the time, they didn't even call it AIDS. They called it GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency Syndrome. The second person, we owned a com an apartment complex in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the second person to die of what we now know as HIV AIDS um, was, a, was a tenant in my mother's apartment complex. And he contracted it uh, through a blood transfusion, and it was a horrible disease. At that point in time, if you had contracted what they were calling GRED, if you coded in the hospital, the nurses and doctors, because they didn't know if it was airborne at that point in time, would only respond to you once. And after that, they just kind of let you die. That's not what HIV and AIDS is today. In fact, the transmission rates are increasing, particularly among one demographic group, and that's yours. Because you all were born into a world where you weren't terrified. I, I mean, I remember being terrified of this disease. And you all have been born into a world where it's manageable. How long has Magic Johnson had HIV and not contract and not develop full blown AIDS? Did you read, did you read the news article where like in London, like the second person the second person to be cured of AIDS, AIDS is, has it heard, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, they now cure two people of HIV. Now it's not a, a, a really feasible process for most people because it involves a bone marrow transplant, but there are all kinds of drugs that can help. I think Magic Johnson has had HIV for about 30 years now. At the time he contracted it, the estimated life expectancy of somebody who contracted HIV was two and a half years and 10 at the most. But with, with drugs, so if you're a drug company, you're going to be working on far more than 25, right? And everybody's going to start, now that they've got the second person who's been cured of HIV, they're going to be really competitive and they're going to jump on that. There's now a cure for hepatitis C. It used to be you got hepatitis C, that was it. You know, you're, you're probably going to die from it. 
It's gonna it's gonna cause liver damage. And you're gonna, but they can manage it. They can now cure Hep C. If you're a small business, obviously you're not gonna be working in 25 or more products at a time. But products fail just like companies fail, and so you need to constantly be developing and improving. So classifications of products. We can classify them as goods or services, basically, and ideas are really services. Um, goods are tangible items, things like my iPhone, this pen, that paper, those are tangible products that you can touch, taste, feel, smell, see, right? Services are intangibles. And the biggest part of our economy, as I've said many times in this class, are services. So it's activities, intellectual property, and benefits. Ideas can be also be marketed, but usually they're in conjunction, they're a service, right? So political campaign specialists, political marketers go out, and one of the things that they're talking about now is that if you aren't jumping into the democratic race, you're probably not going to make it. If you haven't gotten in by now, you're probably not going to make it, because all of the good talent for those idea generators, which are service providers, has been swooped up. So we can classify consumer products by the way they're purchased by the consumer. So when we think about new product development, what kind of product are we looking at? Are we looking at a convenience product? What are convenience products? Well, these are things that are generally cheap that we, that we buy on a consistent, regular basis over and over and over again, um, and that we need, right? Things like, your, is that a sports drink or a an energy drink. drink. It's an energy drink, right? Things like that are convenience products. Coke, Diet Coke, bottled water, you buy them in the in the, um, in the vending machines down the hall. You find them everywhere. Shopping products are ones that we actually think more about. So before we go and buy the new phone, iPhone, we're going to think about it, right? It's a big investment. What is the new iPhone XR cost? What's the starting price of it? So it's a thousand bucks. So you're going to think about that before you go out and chunk down that money, aren't you? How many of you just run right out the minute the new XR came out and plopped down your your thousand bucks? Anybody? No. Okay. So this is something that you're going to think more about. Then specialty products. What are specialty products? Things that you order that are custom. Things that you buy when you graduate from the University of Central Oklahoma. You're going to get a lovely piece of paper that you're going to hang on your wall that says you are educated. And you're probably going to want to do what? Because this is a big deal. Only about 25% of our population, 50% of our population, attempts some level of higher education. What percentage actually graduate with a baccalaureate degree? It's about 25%. So you are in the educational elite when you graduate from college. So you got this nice, it's on nice, thick, bond parchment paper. It's got the president of the university and the board of regents chair in on there. And it's got a nice, pretty gold seal. And you're going to do what with that? Frame. Get it framed. That's custom, right? You're going to want to pick out the mat, the type of frame. And you can put it in the old frame, but that's a... Take the Hobby Lobby, and we're going to get that, that uh, individualized product done, specialty product. And then unsought products. And how do you advertise, and what kinds of things can you do in terms of new product development with unsought products? What are unsought products? Well, these are generally things that we don't think about until we need them. Anybody have just their favorite wrecker? Any of you have your own wrecker service on speed dial on your phone? Wrecker, like for your car. No, nobody has their own wrecker, right? That's an unsought product. How do you find wrecker services when your car breaks down on I-35? Huh? You know, go online. It's an unsought product. Most people go, most people have like AAA or something like that, some kind of car service, and they will find the wrecker for you and send it out to you, right? So the way we develop new products is going to depend on what kinds of things we're coming up with. Convenience products, what are they doing? Consumer packaged goods, they come up with lots and lots of products all the time. Every time a new Disney movie comes out, General Mills or somebody like that will do what? <coughs> They'll come out with a cereal. When Frozen came out, they came out with a Frozen cereal, right? Which was basically, as far as I could tell, Lucky Charms with different marshmallows, right? And that's what it was. But they come out with these new things. 
Shopping products we generally take more time. There's, uh, you know, they, they evolve. What's the biggest trend in furniture, for example? Furniture is a shopping product. Well, when I was a kid growing up, they didn't have <coughs> furniture. I, I'm sort of skeptical of buying this. They didn't have furniture that you could plug your smart device into. Right now, they come up with all these sectionals and and um, theater seating that have stuff so that you can plug your device into it. Um, that's going to take more time than just you know Disney launch a new movie, change the marshmallows on that on that Lucky Charms, and pop that out there. Specialty products, obviously, those are ones that are specially manufactured, and then unsought products, uh, those are the most difficult. And like record services have pretty much been record services you know, for for a long time. Um, business products Pro purchased by people like UCO and providing services. So, like that, we bought all these projectors so that I could project my PowerPoints up there, um, so that we can provide products and services to others. So, components, items that are part and integrated into a final product. So, what are the components, for example, of that? That thing. Now, when I first started teaching, and they first started putting these out, okay, so when I first started teaching, way back in the dark ages, people actually had these things which were called overhead projectors that they used. You all have probably never seen these. And professors would make these transparencies in a copy machine. You'd make, you'd put your, you'd type your, your stuff up, you'd put it in a copy machine and it would copy it onto a transparency and then they would put these on, you know, they pull down the screen and they put their slides on, on this overhead projector thing. Really, really old school. Then we got computers in every classroom and we started getting projectors and things like that. I remember when I first started teaching, we had these, if I want to show a video now, what do I do? I get on YouTube and I show you a video and it goes right, they used to have these TV carts and people would like show movies on VHS cassettes mm -hmm. and then DVDs. They still have DVDs. You probably have never seen a VHS. How many of you have seen a VHS cassette? Oh, you've seen VHS cassettes. Okay. You're not as young as I think you are. <laughs> so, <clears throat> anyway, you'd have these TV cards. If you wanted to show a movie, you had to rent or not rent. You had to go down and sign up for a card. And then they started putting these projectors. Well, what were those first projectors in these classrooms? That projector probably weighs seven pounds, if I'm guessing. The first ones probably weigh 25. The ones they were the light. huge. What? The ones with the light in it? Yeah. They, they were huge. They were bulky. You couldn't just attach them to a pole like that. They came down. You had to make sure that you were into a stud, right? So what are, what are if you're, if you're a, a lens manufacturer, what are you trying to do to manufacture for a device like that? What are kinds of new products are you coming up with? Well, you're trying to come up with a smaller lens that projects just as much, right? The, the first lenses on these things were probably about that big. I remember the first ones that they came in, you know, they were about that, that big. And actually, if they were out of focus, you'd get up and sort of adjust them up there, right? So um, component manufacturers are, are coming up with new ideas for making that smaller. And now you can buy projectors. And those first projectors that they first put in, the classrooms were over a thousand dollars. Now you can buy a projector like that for what? Huh? I'd say less than that. I bet you can buy that projector because I bet we buy them in bulk on a state contract. I bet we get it for a hundred bucks for that projector. Okay. I mean, so components, support products, installation, accessory equipment, all of these people are going to come up with uh, new things industrial services, repair, maintenance, accounting, and auditing. What's some of the big things that they come up with in terms of new products in these areas, industrial services, repair? The way you used to buy a lawyer or buy legal services was you went to the local law firm. Now we have national law firms, basically like LegalZoom, who provides legal services across, uh, you know, for businesses across vast, uh, you know, swaths of, of the United States. You don't have to necessarily go down to downtown Oklahoma City to find a lawyer. So items, lines, and mixes. A product item is a specific stock keeping unit or SKU, right? So the iPhone is a specific SKU. At Sam's, they have a phone center in there. 
and they have a product line. Now, they don't carry everything that you could get if you went into the Verizon store or the at and store. Basically, Sam's carries about six or seven of the most, so they have a, a, a lower product line, six or seven of the most popular products, right? They don't have all of the, all of the products. The, the area that they have is important Sam's is, you know, fairly small, because they, what is Sam's known for? Well, they're not really known for their electronics. They're really known for a lot of other things, right? Basically bulk, mostly grocery, and things like that. And so the product mix are all the lines offered by an organization. So if we go into Sam's, what does Sam's have? Well, they have hard lines, they have um, soft lines, textiles, they have food, they have pet supplies to a limited amount, they have drugs, right? And they have iPhones. So newness, how do we tell whether a product is new? Is the iPhone 10R or XR really that much different from this, which is, I think, an eight? Is it really that much? No. So is it really that new? Well, we can think about newness in terms of when the iPhone first came out, it really was revolutionary. Now, there were people that did, and they, it was basically um, developed you know, Apple came out first with their digitized music. They weren't the first to come up with a digitized music player, but they were the first to really make it popular. And that was the iPod, right? And then they branched out into the iPhone. When the iPhone came out, there were smartphones before the iPhone. But the iPhone was really revolutionary. What made it revolutionary versus a modification of what had come before? I'll show you uh, the first smartphone. The IBM, what was it called? That's what it looked like. Um, I can't remember what it was called. Simon, the, the IBM Simon, and I showed you a picture of it, right? How is this, so I, so Apple didn't come up with the first smartphone, but what made this really, really re revolutionary? It was the first to have a completely touch screen. Most of the smartphones before Apple were what? Is, if you think about Blackberry, they had a keypad. Right? You didn't touch the screen, you used a keypad. Well, what does the touch screen enable you and why was that revolutionary? Because all of a sudden, you can have a much bigger viewing area with the same amount of space. So you can still fit this in your pocket, but you can see a lot more because the keypad can do what? If you're watching a movie, what happens to the keypad? It goes away. Right? So that was really revolutionary. Newness can also be from the consumer's perspective. How much learning? So when the iPhone first came out, it required a lot more learning than, than it does today. Whereas you have continuous innovation, changes in uh, features. So what is the difference between the iPhone 8 and the iPhone 10? Well, is there that much difference? No. What's the biggest change in it? That doesn't require a whole lot of new learning. Uh, face, recognition. face recognition, that doesn't require a whole lot, but also the charging, right? How does the 10 charge? Yeah, it's a pad. yeah I think I don't think the 10 actually has. Does it actually have a charging port? I don't know. I don't have a 10. It does. I mean, I think they started with the charging pad with the 8s, and then... The 10 still has it? Yeah. Does the 10... Or it, also has, it still has a port. It still has a port? Um, but that's the biggest thing, that you've now got wireless charging capabilities, right? Um, dynamically continuous innovation, minor changes uh, in behavior required. So that's basically what the iPhone is. It's basically been sort of a minor uh, steps forward over a, uh, a long period of time. And then you can have discontinuous innovation where you have high levels of learning. So for example, the one I use here is police body cameras. When the police first got these, they were very resistant to using them. Why? 
and they've not necessarily been a good thing for the police department. So, because it, it's sort of uh, really bad for you when you're shooting the guy in the back and it's caught on your body cam. But now they started to learn how to use them, right? And they're powerful evidence. They started out, they didn't put them on police, on police people to begin with. They were actually dash cams. And it was a radical, um, from my perspective as a lawyer, uh, what we could do because all of a sudden, the .08 level is a presumption that you're drunk. But a jury can bust the presumption, and there were these dashboard cams, and attorneys all of a sudden started saying, does that guy look drunk to you? You know, he walked the line. I mean, he did all the things that I can't do, you know, because I've got a bad hip and flat feet. I can't walk a straight line, and I can't lay my head back and touch my nose. But, there, you know, and all of a sudden, this was, this was affecting, for example, the way policing was done. And they had to learn all new sort of ways of dealing with it. From a legal standpoint, the Federal Trade Commission says that up to six months from regular distribution is generally what you can say is new. So when your advertising product is new and improved, up to six months. Now the, the question becomes, what is regular distribution? Lots of things are limited in their release initially to what? Specific areas. And so what, what constitutes the, the question then from that standpoint, from a legal standpoint is, what constitutes regular distribution? From an organizational perspective, we can think about newness from three levels. An extension is low risk, and it involves usually cannibalization. This is what Apple does with their iPhone. Every two years, and it's started to backfire on them, by the way, every two years they release a new version of the iPhone, and it basically cannibalizes their other products, right? They want you to go out and buy the newest, latest version. And then who are they selling those older versions to? They continue to manufacture them for a while. And they sell them to other countries, newly industrialized countries, that, those markets, right? Does it require significant innovation? Does it require a lot of research and development and expenses on, our, on the business's part? Or is it a brand extension? So for example, Google started out as a search provider on the internet, right? But now they're actually producing products, not necessarily very successfully. They came out with something called the Pixel in an attempt to try and capture the market. They've never really caught on because people don't really think of Google as being what? A phone. They think of it as mostly a service. Again, that's trying to reposition yourself in the mind of the consumer. So most companies fail and many new products fail. Even big companies, New Coke is an example. New Coke came out with uh, this new idea for a uh, soft drink based on the Pepsi challenge. It was a horrible failure. So even though they went through what we call all of these protocols, um, it still failed. So what is the protocol? Well, first of all, you have to have a well-defined target market. You have to specify your customers' needs, wants, and preferences, which means that you have to know them. And then you have to know how number two, how those needs and preferences will be specified um, by uh, the product that you're going to develop. So reasons that they fail, insignificant point of difference. I don't think there's a big difference between the 10R or the uh, XR and the, and the X. No economic access to buyers. So lots of consumer packaged group, goods can't make it to poor neighborhoods because of the logistics costs and the risk involved in that. Uh, incomplete protocol call, I put Cliff Hudson here. One of my colleagues and I used to have a company where we did market tests, and she had started out doing market tests for Sonic, and it was the most frustrating thing. She actually started out in Sonic, and she would say, we just had, we just market tested this new stuff, and Cliff Hudson, who was the president and CEO of Sonic, I think he still is, would come in and say, you know what I think? I think we ought to have margarita cherry slush. It's like, what? He's like, I like margaritas and I like cherries. I think we ought to combine them into a slush. Well, no, Cliff, the fact that you like think that's going to work doesn't necessarily mean it will work. Um, releasing at bad timing in an economic recession, for example, can mean that your product will fail. Poor quality, Microsoft Vista is an example of this. It was a horrible product. Lots of Microsoft products are horrible. Um, too small a market, and then poor execution in the marketing mix. So you may have a really great product, but if you don't, if you don't execute the marketing mix, that uh, product promotion, the place, um, and price, 
uh, in the right way, you can fail. So I will not test you. I'm going to stop there since I'm out of time. I will not test on the seven steps for new product development um, on the exam, but you can look at the, uh, the rest of the PowerPoint that you're on, D2L if you want, um, and then we'll have the second exam um, a, not a week from today, it will be uh, a week from Tuesday. All right. Have a good spring break. Enjoy yourself next week. Your time off. Yes. Question. Oh, just registered. Oh, you did it. Let me. Yeah, you did it. Whatever you're talking about. Um, when you're explaining, I'm sorry. Come on. Come on.